So as we start on Lent here, uh, it's not the first time you've heard me say, it's not the first time you've heard others say, do we actually need Lent after a whole year of pandemic that feels like a whole year of Lent? I uh, was thinking about that as well, looking at this first story that we're looking at today, the story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. This is a story that I have preached multiple times times. It's a story that often launches us into Lent. And what is amazing to me is every one of these sermons ends up being very distinct. There's something about the capacity of God and God's Word for us to come back to it at different points in life, at different seasons in life. And when we'll really sit with it, inhabit it, walk around with it, let it live with us, God seems to feed us in whole new ways and open new things up. And this is the way we're actually approaching our devotional guides, our workbooks for Lent this week. As you uh, have perhaps heard me say, if you had a chance to watch the introduction video online, we are taking one story, one theme each week and letting the Lord speak to us in multiple different ways for the same story. Because even as we have hope of uh, emerging from this pandemic soon, hope in these vaccines coming out, hope in the fact that the, the numbers seem to be going down in a really encouraging way in terms of number of infections in King County. Alongside all of this, there's a real uh, weariness, isn't there? Maybe even a wariness to how things are going to look on the other side of this season. It's like we can go uh, about our business day in and day out, and then suddenly one day it'll just catch up with us when we don't expect it. We feel it in our relationships, we feel it in our bodies, we feel it in our spirits and our souls. And pastorally, what I've really been thinking and praying about coming into Lent is the role of faith in all of this. How do we live as a people of faith in the times that we're in right now? I don't mean the role of faith as in knowing what to confess we believe. We know what we believe, and we believe our confessions. But it can be a real challenge to actually live as people of faith, to live from that faith, instead of out of some other resource, some other motivation, particularly in these days. And Lent is traditionally a season to recenter our faith and refocus our purpose. Now that may sound really exhausting to you right now in the middle of this pandemic or whatever else is going on in life. So let me tell you some good news. The good news about Lent is that it's the grace of Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, who refocuses our faith, who refocuses our purpose, who does the deep work of transformation in us. This is a God who could take a little boy's lunch and feed thousands of people. That's the surplus of grace available in Jesus Christ. This is Jesus who can take the little bit of time and attention that we're able to give him each day as we walk through Lent and multiply it to bring transformation in our lives. Jesus is the source and the center and the focus of our faith. And so we start today with this temptation story, which it struck me as I was preparing it. No one else was a witness to this. The rest of our stories, there are witnesses. Jesus was the only one there. But this story was important enough that he needed his followers immediately and all of us who followed in their stead to understand it and see it and know it. So let's listen to it. This is from Luke chapter 4, 1 to 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell the stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. 
for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led Jesus to Jerusalem, had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all these temptings, he left him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, Lent is traditionally a time, it's a time where, you know, often we think about taking the sins in our lives and uh, kind of swapping them out for something better, right? Maybe a little less gluttony and a little more prayer kind of thing. But the story that is launching us into Lent isn't about minor adjustments to daily transgressions. This is a story about a testing of an entire identity and purpose. This is a story that seems to warn us the real danger here isn't the minor daily transgressions. The real danger is the tempting of faith. Faith that determines our identity and our purpose. The kind of faith that ensures our life isn't just a wandering in vain in the wilderness. Jesus in the wilderness, this wasn't about, you know, the temptation to transgression. You could hear the testing of his entire identity. Twice you heard the devil say it, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God. Remember that Jesus had just been baptized. The voice from heaven had said, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And here's Jesus out in the wilderness. If you're the beloved son of God, it's a testing of his very center, his very, his very core. He goes right to the heart of Jesus' identity, his mission in the world. This journey towards all power and authority, splendor and glory entrusted and given to him. See, in the wilderness, it's Jesus' faith and his purpose that are at stake. Now, you might go, hold on, hold on, hold on. Isn't it a little weird to talk about Jesus' faith? I always find myself thinking this. Maybe you're better at this than I am, but, but I'll find, if we, well, how do we actually talk about Jesus' faith, right? I mean, he's God. How much faith does it take? But this is important. See, it feels awkward to talk about Jesus' faith, but at the same time, Jesus himself is the source and the object and the center and the model for our own faith. So if we can't learn about faith from Jesus, if we can't receive the power of faith from Jesus, where do we go? So I want to take the first little bit of this sermon, this reflection on the text, to look at Jesus' faith, because Jesus' faith is lived out in faithfulness. And then I want to take the second part of our reflection to look at what Jesus gives us to also live with faith and faithfulness and purpose in our lives. So first, let's look at Jesus' faith, his faithfulness in the wilderness as this source and this model for our own faith. So that it's, it's actually Jesus who's at work in recentering our faith and refocusing our purpose. See, the wilderness for Jesus, the wilderness is a place of chaos. It's a place where identity and purpose, that's what's on the line. The wilderness you'll remember in our big story. Do you remember this? Do you remember the wilderness generation? Do you remember this generation that had been rescued as God's beloved out of Egypt? But they had such a chronic, such a habitual uh, disruption to their faith, disruption to their total reliance on God. They were just habitually unfaithful. They habitually took up something other than faith 
at the center so that they died without ever realizing the purposes that God had for them. They died without ever entering the land that had been promised to Abraham. They died wandering in the wilderness. And then here's Jesus. Here's Jesus who picks up their story in order to transform their failures and their frailties into his faithfulness and his purpose. Here's Jesus who picks up all our failures and our frailties and invites us into his faith, his purpose. So what's unique to Jesus' own identity and mission in this story? Well, just briefly, here's a few things that I like to notice. First of all, you notice that Jesus was hungry. This is totally understandable. 40 days, 40 nights, that's pretty amazing. And the first thing the devil starts out with is his appetite. If you're the son of God, use this power given you to meet your own needs. Satisfy your appetite. Satisfy this hunger. Now remember, let's be clear, it's absolutely reasonable that Jesus was hungry. The reality of his appetite wasn't the issue, but the appetite is where Satan went, where the devil went to try to hook him. It's like in our readings for James this week in our workbook, if you've had a chance to look at that yet, where, you know, sin starts when the devil entices our desires, tries to hook our desires. So here's this appetite, here's this desire for bread. It's been 40 days, 40 nights, and the solution according to the devil, is serve yourself. Turn these stones to bread. And then the second temptation. The second temptation in, in the Luke's telling of the story is the devil showing Jesus all the powers, all the authority, all the kingdoms of the world, promising Jesus their splendor. And actually, this is again where the devil, you know, he's just so smart. He just kind of comes at it slant. Because the truth is, the end point of Jesus' mission God's intended purpose for Jesus' mission is that all power, authority, glory, honor, and praise will be entrusted to him. That every kingdom and authority will come under his reign and that at his name, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bow. I mean, this is where Jesus is going. The issue is the means to that end. The outcome isn't the issue, it's the means to the end. And you heard the, you heard the devil's invitation, serve me, worship me. The first temptation to Jesus' faith, his faithfulness, serve yourself. The second temptation to Jesus' faith, his faithfulness, serve me. The third temptation, doesn't God serve you? Devil takes him to the highest point of the temple in Jerusalem. You know, you can step right off the edge here he says, because it is written. And I don't know if you, like me, when I was going through the workbook this week and, you know, circling what the devil was up to and putting squares on on what God was up to and where God's voice was, I noticed that right in the middle of the circle of this temptation was a square of God's actions and God's voice. Here's the devil again, going at it slant, quoting scripture. This is why you don't want to tangle with the devil on his own terms. Because trust me, he knows the Bible better than you do. He knows the Bible better than any of us. And we don't even catch what he's doing until Jesus replies. It says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. God does not serve you. You serve God. You hear that third temptation from the devil? Doesn't God serve you? Doesn't God serve you? And Jesus rejects it. Serve yourself, serve me. Come on, God serves you, right? And maybe you recognize, it's okay if you didn't, that all of Jesus' answers back to the devil, these answers he gave are all quotations from the scriptures that Jesus learned ever since childhood, ever since he was a little boy. He knew these quotations, and you know where they come from? They come from the word of God that God had equipped his people with in the wilderness. They'd been entrusted to God's people in the wilderness, his people who failed because they constantly, chronically allowed their faith to be displaced. 
Jesus used the very words that God had provided through Moses to them to answer the devil himself. Now we'll come back to the specifics of those answers in a minute because they're essential, uh, especially it seems for us in the places of wilderness in our lives. But for just a moment, I also wanna kind of cast ahead a little bit to Jesus' mission, to the way that Jesus lived out faithfully his identity and his purpose compared to these temptations of the devil. Because here's the devil, first temptation, serve yourself. And what does Jesus do? He gives himself to others. I am the bread of life. I am the living water. Take, eat. This is my body. Instead of directing his powers to serve his own appetites, Jesus fully gives himself the living word to serve us. Which pivots right into that second temptation, that second temptation of the devil to serve him, serve me. Jesus made it so clear throughout his ministry that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. My means, my way is entirely different. Jesus is a mission that lays down all power, that lays down all authority to serve others. Tempted to serve himself, Jesus gives himself fully to us. Tempted to worship and serve the devil, Jesus lays down and serves us. And tempted to presume, to presume that God would serve him, Jesus made it so clear throughout his entire mission, I'm doing the will of my Father. That, the day and the time, that's not for me to know. It's the Father who knows that. He taught us to pray, not, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that final agonizing prayer in the garden, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was so clear his entire life. He served God. God was not at his beck and call. See, Jesus' faith is his faithfulness to this identity and to this mission as the Son of God, faithfully giving himself, faithfully serving rather than exercising authority as a way of exercising his authority, faithfully submitting to God's will. And so this is the source of our faith. This is where we go to for our faith. Our faith is in Jesus faithfulness. Our faith doesn't come about by like, you know, hunkering down and doing our best to be faithful. Our faith comes from turning to Jesus, to Jesus' faithfulness as the source and the center and the object as the model for our faith. And Jesus gives us everything we need here. He invites us to himself in the story in the wilderness that he made sure his disciples had. He made sure we have and he gives us everything we need for faith in the wilderness. And boy, do we need this. Because you know, every age, I suppose, every time and every society has its wilderness aspects, but there's some particular areas of, of the age that we live in, the times that we live in that are, that are chaotic, that are wilderness sort of times. And these were here before the pandemic even descended on us. We live in the secular age. It's an age where, you know, belief, it's, it's a sphere of contested belief. We live in an age that Charles Taylor, who's a Canadian philosopher, describes as an age with the possibility of an exclusive humanism. A closed story where the whole story happens within human history and the material world. We live in an age where there's a way of constructing meaning and significance with no reference to the divine or the transcendent. Ever since September, we've been preaching and looking at and studying this, this big story of scripture that goes from the creation of the whole cosmos to the new creation of the cosmos. But this is not the story of our age. The story of our age, you know, has a ceiling, a beginning and an end that completely revolves around human history, that is totally dedicated to the material. It's exhausting, it's exhausting to keep up a life of faith in the transcendent, in God's story, in the reality of the invisible and the unseen. 
in the midst of our world. Everyday life, it seems to me, it, it really is, it's a wilderness. It's a constant, tempting faith. Inviting us to place our hopes and our best energies into really much smaller stories, stories that work in this closed system of the world. And by all means, you know, find some sort of faith or belief in you, we hear around us, whatever works for you, but there's no recognition that there might actually be a legitimate faith in something that is legitimately transcendent and eternal. And what makes it so tricky is that with so many different beliefs, I mean, we all live just right next door to each other. We rub shoulders with each other. We have so many people of so many different belief systems. And do you ever have these moments where you think to yourself, okay, but that seems to be working for them. So is it just a matter of choosing whatever belief works for you? Is there something bigger? Is there something more? It's, we also live in a time that seems to haunt us with this sense that even for those who want to completely reject any idea of God, there's a deep desire to not live in vain. This deep anxiety to not simply be wandering in the wilderness. There's still a desire for purpose, even if it's disconnected from any conviction or interest in faith. One writer said that we live in an age when you can stop being burdened by what eternity or salvation demands and simply frame ultimate flourishing within this world. Stop being burdened by any eternal or salvation demands and simply frame ultimate flourishing within this world. Seems to me these temptations faced by Jesus describe the offers of ultimate flourishing in the middle of this world really, really well. It's this offer of, of putting our faith in flourishing in meeting our appetites. It's this offer of putting our faith in human flourishing in authority. It's this offer of putting our faith for the sake and purpose of human flourishing in autonomy or self-determination. A certain invulnerability in the world because after all, hasn't God said he's got your back? When we actually completely celebrate the totally autonomous individual, the person who can live independent from any social constraints. If you think about it for a moment, you know, this time that we're living in, I think about this as a preacher. If I as a preacher, when I as a preacher, suggest that for human flourishing, for someone to live fully into the image of God and flourish as a human, if I were to suggest that anyone not live into the full potential of their appetites, perfectly reasonable appetites, it's reasonable to be hungry after 40 days and 40 nights not eating. It would be a non-starter for me to suggest that people not seek empowerment or authority. It would be a non-starter to suggest that self-determination or autonomy are not the way to salvation in our current society. It feels like we're violating something, right? If we don't somehow put right at the center of human flourishing, this, this meeting of these, these healthy and reasonable needs and appetites that people have. If we don't put at the center of human flourishing this empowerment and authority in one's own life, if we don't put at the center of human flourishing, self-determination, this autonomy. It's why faith is so hard. It's why we need Lent so badly for Jesus' faithfulness to put faith back at the center and refocus our purpose. Because remember, the issue wasn't that Jesus wasn't hungry. He was hungry, and there's no problem with that. 40 days, 40 nights famished. In fact, in one of the other gospel accounts, the angels came and fed him. It wasn't the issue that power and authority were not his end goal, because that's where he landed. And it wasn't true that God would not have Jesus back, because God did. He raised him from the dead. The issue was faith. 
Remember what Jesus said? Uh, what's wrong with this verse? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, because all the rest of that stuff, it just doesn't matter. It's not what he said, is it? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all of these things shall be added unto you as well. It's the center. It's the faithful center. It's Jesus' faithfulness at the center. But how do we actually live there with all the other pressures and all the other temptations and everything else that seems to make so much sense everywhere else? How do we live out this faith? Live faithfully with Jesus. This is where Jesus responses responses to Satan, to the devil, are so important. Because what Jesus does is when we come to Jesus in faith, to Jesus' faithfulness, he reorders our appetites. He reorders authority. He reorders autonomy toward life and salvation from the only source of life and salvation, and that is God. So at the end, just a few moments, I'm going to ask you to reflect. On, on ways that Jesus teaches us to reorder our appetites or our uh, seeking power and authority or our autonomy. And I'm going to suggest that what Jesus gives us as the faithful center is the word from God, worship and serve God alone, and willingness. Willingness, thy will be done with God. In place of appetites at the center, we're given the word. In place of authority as our center, we're given worship and service of God. In place of autonomy, our self-reliance, our self-autonomy at the center, we're giving willingness. And I wonder which of these three temptations is most dangerous in your own faith right now and, 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 and what it will look like this Lent to live into Jesus' invitation. Because Jesus answers the temptations that the devil throws down to serving our appetites, our identity, and our purpose with a word of God or a word from God. We see this especially in, um, uh, in when Matthew and Mark tell this story. They remind us that when Jesus says the full verse from Deuteronomy, where it says, you know, humanity you know, doesn't live by bread alone, but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, the answer, when we focus on what Jesus gives us, don't dance with the devil, don't mess with what the devil's trying to tempt you with, don't, don't debate whether this appetite is good or bad or whatever. Just come right back to what Jesus' answer was. It's the word of God. It's the word of God at the center. It's why we keep the word of God at the center of our connect groups and our spiritual friendships, of our worship. It's why our um, Lent guides begin with reading the word, praying the word. It's why in the readings that we have from the book of James in our workbooks, James tells us, listen, draw near to God and he will draw near to you when we're trying to resist temptation. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And the place we draw near to God is the word from God. Now the word of God is of course what is captured in the Bible, what is captured in scripture. But the word of God is also so much more than that. The word of God is the call of God. It's the revelation of God. Remember, the word of God was the power that spoke all creation into existence. The word of God is wisdom from God. And it's an invitation from God to draw near, to be in relationship with him. The gift and the invitation of the word of God is to draw near to the God of the word. It's the power of God breaking in from outside of ourselves, from this closed story. A breaking in from outside our self-perceived material or temporal story to reorder our appetites around God as a source of life and flourishing. It says in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ, from the word of God. That's the center and the source of our faith. And in addition to that, in Romans 10, 18, remember, it doesn't just stop there. Romans 10, 18, 
right after it says faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ, talks from Psalm 19. It says this, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. And now here's what's quoted in Romans. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. See, we need to remember the sacramental vision of life. It's Jesus who gave himself in simple bread and simple juice. One of the great gifts of the word of God captioned in scripture of drawing near to the God who's the creator in the midst of the scripture is it opens our eyes then to all the ways and places that God breaks in and God speaks and God interacts to us in the physical world that he has made and which he sustains. It's where creation and arts and beauty and great food and the pleasures of this life are received as gifts, giving glory to God, an encounter with God. So we recognize them, you know, as this means of faith. Through the faith that comes from hearing the call and the invitation of God in his, in his written words. There's one um, agnostic author I was reading who doesn't believe in Christ, who doesn't believe in faith, who doesn't believe in Christianity, but he loves the arts. He loves to visit churches. He loves religious art. And he made the observation. He said, you know, Christianity hasn't lasted so long simply because of claims to truth or the exercise of power. It's also beautiful. What if, he wondered, you heard Mozart's Requiem as something other than fiction. The word of God in scripture was never meant to stop at the end of the bindings of the book that is printed on. It's meant to take us into all of life responding to the voice and the call of God. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. And Jesus answers this limited focus on meeting our, our immediate appetites from the material world by calling us back to this word from God, God who's the source and the power of all life. And Jesus answers the temptation to authority, to pursuing authority, to pursuing power, to having faith in authority and power for, for our identity or our purpose, or that where the, maybe the, uh, the, the means justify, the ends justify the means, with the call to worship and serve God alone. You know, this relates to James too. Do you remember what James said in our readings this week in the workbook? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's what worship does. Worship resists this claim that the lives we live in, the space we live in, is completely under the devil's authority. That there's a closed story and he's in charge. Worship resists that by turning the best of who we are our hearts, our minds, our voices, our body, our spirit to the God who made all things, whose voice we hear in the scriptures, whose voice reverberates and echoes in all of creation in the material world. In a world without the transcendent, without God, you know, worship really makes no sense. Power is pretty much the whole story. But Jesus calls us back to worship to worship, when we are overly obsessed with the powers and the authorities of this age, he calls us back to worship. So that's why you'll find in our workbooks for Lent, there's worship and there's rest in the presence and the promises of God and there's uh, prayer. There's also not only those aspects of worship, but remember what Jesus said, worship and serve. There's also ways that we practice, that we serve, that we work out what we're reading in worship and service of God. The word, worship, and then the third answer that Jesus gives to the temptations that Satan throws down is willingness. We are not the ones that test God. In the writings from James, the way that James put this is submit yourselves to God. Boy, this is a hard one. We're independent people, we're autonomous people, we're self-reliant people. We are, uh, we are completely focused so easily on ourselves.
But Jesus says, you know, you've got to keep this straight. Don't put God to the test. Submit to God. Give God your willingness. And this is what we work on when we gather in our spiritual friendships, in our reflection, in our rest, to be people who are willing, who are willing with God. So let's take some time to reflect just now then as we continue on this Lenten uh, journey. We've got some wonderful music, some beautiful music in our worship from French horns, my favorite instrument. We've got wonderful music. And the purpose of this beauty is to give us a chance to reflect on which of those temptations, uh, appetite, authority, autonomy, which of it's really in danger of being the place where you put your trust, where you put your faith, where you put your reliance, that you make it the, 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 the center of your best energy, the source of your hope? You know, if, the, if you've got a lot of anxiety right now around the pandemic or health, even if they're reasonable anxieties about the material and physical needs, there's no shame in the hunger but there is an invitation from Jesus to redirect focus to the God who calls you in his word. Maybe you found yourself absolutely uh, obsessed with what's going on in the political these days. You find yourself um, just righteously angry at the way power or authority is misused. And Jesus gives a warning. You need to redirect. Redirect to worship. Redirect to practices in service. Worship and the practice of the word may be especially important during these days of Lent for you. Or maybe, you know, it's just autonomy. It's this willfulness. It's a stubbornness that you're aware of in yourself. And what's needed is the willingness of faith. There's an invitation this Lent to, to reflect and to rest in the presence of Jesus. So let's finish up this reflection, this listening time in the word by reflecting during the offering of this music on where is Jesus especially inviting you to faith during this time and in this place in the area of appetite or authority or autonomy and let him direct you to whether it's especially important to hear the invitation to the word of God or to worship or to willingness this Lent. Let's reflect together. <laughs>